Um, and you've probably all seen these man-made bodies of water on the side of the road um, or like in the middle of an urban landscape next to um, like a shopping center um, or even like a housing development. These retention ponds are everywhere. Um, and they are strategically placed to capture stormwater runoff as it's flowing across um, roads and parking lots and impervious surfaces. So surfaces that don't allow water to infiltrate into the ground. Like grass is a pervious surface and um, a parking lot is an impervious surface. So I'm going to use those terms a lot. So just, just so you know what they are. Um, and retention ponds are actually twofold. So um, first and foremost, they are designed to slow down or even capture incoming water, like I said, that's flowing off of impervious surfaces. Um, and they're al also designed to uh, capture and oftentimes filter pollutants that are being picked up as water is flowing. So, you know, this can be things like motor oil or debris, sediment, even road salts, um, fertilizers, anything that's on um, the surface of the ground that can be picked up as rain is kind of flowing um, across across the land. So uh, typically a retention pond will include certain characteristics that um, make it function as what I just described. So you know, a grass buffer and vegetation, which like on the outside, you've probably all seen. Um, so that acts to capture contaminants and then also just initially slow down that flow of water. So um, the vegetation is actually extremely important, just like vegetation is important in any watershed um, to slow down contaminants, prevent erosion, etc. Um, and then the actual depression, the actual pond is is equally as important because it acts as a place where water can actually um, like exist, where it can be held, um, and then also um, just collecting sediment as well as anything else that is flowing into the pond. Um, so then next is mulch, and then and specifically engineered soils um, that also help to filter water and prevent pollution or prevent erosion and then finally a sand bed or some side of some type of under drain system um, to help aerate the pond and keep water flowing so this um, under drain system is really um, specific to each retention pond like not all contain this under drain system um, some are just like a really basic depression where water can where water can um, be captured um, but then some have these really you know expensive to build under drain systems where you know water is actively being being trout or being transported through a pipe um, so yeah it really depends on a lot of a lot of different factors um, so an interesting thing that I that I think is important to share is that not all retention ponds are lined. So um, what that means is that oftentimes they'll have this lining to prevent water from entering the groundwater or the the soil underneath. Um, and this is a particularly particularly important thing to keep in mind when we talk about drinking water um, a little bit later on. So sometimes states and municipalities will keep the retention ponds unlined on purpose. Um, and this is to allow water to percolate down into the groundwater and kind of be naturally filtered um, before it enters aquifers and then people's wells. Um, that can be a bad thing, which again, we'll, we'll get into. Um, and then other municipalities and states will make sure that there is a lining on all retention ponds or certain retention ponds to prevent water from percolating into the groundwater um, and causing contamination in really, really important aquifers that might be used for drinking water. So it's really 
um, situationally specific um, and then state and municip municipal municipality specific. Um, so there's a lot of variability with what these retention ponds look like, their function, etc. So, um, and then I guess one other thing is, you know, does every single urban development require a retention pond? So, you know, if you're wanting to build a strip mall, for example, or a Home Depot or, or whatever it might be, do, do I, do you need to, you know, build a retention pond? So the short answer is no. Um, and states are typically in charge of determining um, if a retention pond is necessary. Um, and there's also a formulation that goes into determining if you need a retention pond um, and also the size of the retention pond. So this formulation takes into account um, the surface area that the pond is going to be, um, I guess, protecting against or working in conjunction with. Um, it also takes into account the flow rate of water, you know, where you live, if you live in a really, um, a really arid place where there's not a lot of rain, maybe you don't need that large of a retention pond. If you live in, you know, Seattle, maybe, maybe you have a more robust retention pond with all of the under draining and because there's a lot more moving water. Um, so yeah, the formulation really determines when it's needed and then um, the actual size and characteristics of the retention pond. So um, this really, as I'm talking, it kind of seems like this is like a fix all for water quality, right? Like it just makes sense that, oh, we have this great pond that captures everything and then out comes this like clean water that, you know, can be, um, or that won't disrupt a drinking water source or a groundwater well. Um, and so this isn't always the case, um, particularly as urban development is increasing and human interaction with, um, with kind of like our, our lawns and yards is increasing and becoming more dependent on uh, fertilizers. <laughs> Someone said, why is water flow so interesting? It is very interesting. Um, so, so sometimes they don't work. Um, and that's just becoming an increasing, it's increasingly becoming a problem um, because they are getting overloaded with nutrients. So like I said, you know, as water is flowing, picking up fertilizers and soils and pesticides and everything, and it's being dumped into this retention pond, the, they're actually being overloaded with nutrients. So what, what happens then is algae and plants start to grow. And when they die and when they decompose, they actually deoxygenate the water. So the water becomes uh, really stale and just really covered in algae. It's not really um, functioning the way it was designed with the vegetation and the grasses and um, everything else that makes a retention pond kind of work. So that's that's a huge concern and whenever you see like a really a green retention pond you might ask yourself oh is that functioning the way it was intended like is it actually filtering water is it actually doing its job so something to keep in mind when you're driving past one of these retention ponds. Um, so I guess we'll just get into how retention ponds either improve or um, make drinking water worse. So how, how do they interact with drinking water and yeah. Um, so as you can imagine, retention ponds can absolutely improve water quality um, if they're working properly and if they're being aerated and and if they're really like being looked after um, and not just like a pond that's sitting there with a lot of algae on, on the surface. So yeah, they can absolutely slow down the flow rate of water. They can capture contaminants before that water moves into a drinking water source. Um, they can also eliminate um, 
contaminants from entering groundwater. So if you live on a private well and there's a retention pond a couple miles down the road, um, if it's lined, then you know that those contaminants aren't percolating into your private well. So it can absolutely be a good thing. Um, and if they're strategically placed, they 100% can improve water quality. Um, however, Oh, actually, one more point. So because, sorry, because only, because municipal water providers are only required to test for and remove 90 contaminants, basically, if, if retention ponds are doing the heavy lifting on all of the unregulated contaminants or even the regulated ones, it's just less of a lift for these treatment facilities. Um, and so any sort of protection, any sort of buffer of those contaminants, both regulated and unregulated, is a good thing. So, you know, that's, that's why, or there, that's how they can work and absolutely be useful to improving water quality. On the other hand, um, if they are unlined, like I mentioned earlier, and you live two miles away from, a, from an unlined retention pond on a private well, or, or even 10 or, or more, because we know that water can move for miles underground. Um, so if it's unlined and there are road salts and motor oil and other harmful contaminants, um, it can percolate through the groundwater. Not all of, it's, not all of it gets filtered through the soil, um, especially ones that um, don't easily break down, like PFAS or, you know, like chromium-6 or whatever it is, um, that can easily enter your private well. So just something to keep in mind, again, um, to know, know kind of the landscape of where you're buying a house um, and the health of a nearby retention pond or, is really, really important as well. So that kind of sums it up. I hope everyone learned something about retention ponds. They're definitely something that you don't think about or, or you might even take for granted on any given day. Um, just driving down the street and seeing a pond next to a Home Depot, you might not think much of it, but um, they're actually really important to water quality and definitely an important thing to notice and advocate for um, in your municipality. So if you have any questions, you can DM us um, on our Instagram. You can also email hello at hydroweave.com or go to hydroweave.com and use our live chat feature. We have scientists standing by um, waiting to answer any, or, any of your questions regarding retention ponds or water quality, um, anything of the nature. So yeah, I hope everyone has um, a great Wednesday and I will see you all next week. So have a good one. Bye.